um, uh, President Paul back uh, from the campaign trail. On this vote, the yeas are 241, like the nays are 178. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the resolution is adopted. The gentleman from Florida. I ask for a recorded vote. The gentleman from Florida requests a recorded vote. Those favoring recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five minute vote. This is a vote on the rule for the bill that deals with the water regulations in California's San Joaquin Valley. If the bill, if the rule passes, there will be an hour of general debate and consideration of nine amendments. Well, congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle were at the White House this afternoon. The Associated Press says for a low-key White House talk with Republican and Democratic congressional leaders with no pressing deadlines, feuds, or crises in what was described as an effort to find potential areas of legislative bipartisanship, the AP says it was the first such session at the White House since last July. Later today at the White House, President Obama and the First Lady will host a dinner for members of the military who served in Iraq and Afghanistan and their families. We got a preview from this morning's Washington Journal. Joining us now on the phone is David Jackson, White House reporter for USA Today. We'll discuss uh, tonight's, today's White House dinner to honor Iraq veterans. First, David, just give us a background on how this came about. Um, basically, uh, President Obama was looking for some way to honor uh, U.S. service in Iraq, but you know, didn't want a parade or didn't want a, a huge big to-do. And I, should, I have to give credit where credit is due, but USA Today's Greg Zaroya picked up some of this at the Pentagon and heard that the idea was for a special dinner, a state dinner-like event at the White House to honor all the branches of the service who uh, participated in Iraq, and that's what's happening tonight. Uh, there'll be uh, a, a little more than 200 guests at the White House <clears throat> representing all branches of the service, and it's, it's basically just a dinner to honor uh, the U.S. sacrifices in Iraq. Yeah, and it is like a state dinner. I mean, we're, we're planning to be there with our cameras, but it's pooled press for remarks only. Right. Why is right. that? Um, it's just the way the White House do these things. It's uh, the coverage, it, the scope of coverage gets smaller and smaller with each White House. Now, they do this for traditional state dinners, too. Now, the only time we get in is for the remarks and the toast that were excluded from the actual dinner itself. In this case, it's, it's, I must confess it's particularly galling because it's, it's a national event and involves U.S. troops. So there's not really any, foreign any sensitive foreign policy matters involved. I'm not quite sure why the entire dinner isn't open. So uh, what's the agenda for tonight's dinner? Um, well, basically, it's just uh, there's, there's no entertainment like there are at a lot of state dinners. It's just, it's, it's just dining and the remarks we made by the president and other military officials. They haven't disclosed the full agenda yet, but... It's basically uh, dinner and speeches. And who's going to be attending, and, and how, w how were the guests selected? This was done through the Pentagon. Um, as we said, uh, more than 200 guests, and um, there'll be, let's see, let me give you the, the White House description is as follows. It uh, includes men and women in uniform from all ranks, services, states, and backgrounds, representing the many thousands of Americans who served in Iraq. And the Pentagon basically is determining the guest list, and it's divided among the Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, and Marines, and Navy in proportion to that service's role in Iraq. And, and do we know, David Jackson, if uh, vets who lost their lives will be represented in any way at tonight's dinner? I'm sure that will be the main focus. That will be one of the main focuses, and that will be a tribute to those who lost their lives. I'm, I'm not sure if there'll be any representatives as such, but it is something that, that the president planned to touch on in, in his remarks. And you talked about this a little bit at the beginning, uh, mentioning a, a possible parade. There have been critics of, of this dinner. What are people saying on both sides of, of for and against tonight's dinner? Um, well, it's frank, I don't think a lot of people know about it. Uh, we wrote our story uh, in January, and it hasn't been picked up a whole lot of places. And this week I was surprised to hear that some people were surprised this event was taking place. So it really hasn't gotten the publicity I think it deserves. But in terms of what you're saying, a lot of people have, have said that the president should find some public forum in which to honor uh, our sacrifices in Iraq, whether it's a parade or a special event or something, some gesture 
should be made in order to, to honor what we did in Iraq. And the, the White House would say this is exactly what this dinner is for. And I think privately what some people would say is, you know, the war in Iraq was very divisive, not quite as divisive as the Vietnam War, but there were qu quite a few political divisions over the decision to go into Iraq that remain. And so therefore, I think that there was a feeling that people had to be careful about how this uh, particular conflict was honored. All right. David Jackson with USA Today. Thank you for your time this morning. Right, thank you. And that dinner later this evening at the White House. We want to let you know we will have coverage on the C-SPAN networks. Uh, stay close to C-SPAN.org. Take a look at that later for possible live coverage uh, on the C-SPAN networks. Here on C-SPAN, the House uh, in the middle of uh, the second of three votes. This one's on the rule for a bill dealing with uh, water regulations in California's San Joaquin Valley. The rule would provide for an hour of general debate and nine amendments to be considered. One more five-minute vote uh, will follow this one. are 245, the nays are 117, the resolution is agreed to. With, without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the journal stands approved. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Speaker, I ask for the ayes and nays. The ayes and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the ayes and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. The ayes and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. It's the last vote in the series, a vote on the journal, the official written record of the previous day's activities. Ahead, an hour of general debate and nine amendments, amendments on a bill that would uh, deal with, with water regulations in California's San Joaquin Valley. Well, for a second day of testimony, General uh, Dempsey and Defense Secretary Leon Panetta back on Capitol Hill today, this time before the House Budget Committee, testifying on their fiscal year 2013 budget. You'll see that later in our schedule. The leaders also met today, according to the Associated Press, with Israel's defense minister to discuss the ongoing tensions with Iran and Syria amid escalating speculation that the Israelis will launch a preemptive strike against Tehran's nuclear facilities. Secretary Panetta hosted the session at his Pentagon office, according to uh, the Associated Press, with Ehud Barak of Israel and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs.
On this vote, the yeas are 283, the nays are 127, two voting present. The uh, journal stands approved. Mr. Speaker? For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns to meet at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Section so ordered. Mr. Speaker? For what purpose does the gentleman rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill H.R. 1837. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 566 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 1837. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 1837, in which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to address certain water-related concerns on the San Joaquin River and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, <coughs> and the gentleman from California, Mr. Nap Ms. Nap Napolitano, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Mr. Chairman, the House is not in order. Gentleman's correct. The committee will be in order. Shh. Gentlemen may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of H.R. 1837, the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley Water Reliability Act. Like California, my central Washington district is heavily dependent on irrigated water to support my agriculture industry. I understand the importance of having a stable, reliable water supply. I've witnessed how government regulations and environmental lawsuits can create conflicts where people and jobs are the losers. However, Mr. Chairman, I have never seen anything like the economic devastation that San California's San Joaquin Valley has experienced as a direct result of federal policies that rest restrict water supplies and that created this man-made drought. In 2009, federal regulations to protect an endangered species, three-inch fish, led to the deliberate di diversion. Mr. Chairman, the House will the gentleman order. suspend. The House the committee is not in order. Gentlemen may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me repeat, in 2009, federal regulations to protect an endangered three-inch fish led to the deliberate diversion of over 300 billion, Mr. Chairman, 300 billion gallons of water away from the San Joaquin Valley farmers. This caused hundreds of thousands of acres of fertile farmland to dry up. It put thousands of people out of work, and it caused unemployment to reach 40% in some communities. Last April, the Natural Resources Committee traveled to Fresno for a field hearing where we heard directly from farm workers and valley growers who have been devastated and seen their livelihoods pushed to the brink by this man-made drought. We heard stories of farm workers who normally feed the nation being forced to stand in food bake lights to receive handouts of carrots, carrots from China. Mother Nature temporarily rescued this region with historic precipitation last year, but another man-made drought is just around the corner if we do nothing. Rain and snow levels have declined, and just last week the federal government announced that the San Joaquin Valley farmers 
would receive only 30 percent of their initial water allocation for this year. This is unacceptable and, and if Congress doesn't act now, we will once again see farm workers having to abandon the fields and return to the food lines. Families and communities in California have waited far too long for Congress to act. In 2009, Mr. Chairman, and in 2010, Mr. Chairman, while this man-made drought was devastating California, the Obama administration and a Democrat-led Congress did nothing. Republicans are ready to act today on a bipartisan legislation that will end this man-made drought and protect up to 30,000 jobs. This comprehensive solution would restore water deliveries that have been cut off due to federal re regulations and environmental lawsuits. It will ensure a reliable water supply for people and for fish and will secure water rights just generally. And it will save taxpayer money by ending unnecessary and dubious government projects. I want to stress, Mr. Chairman, that this man-made drought does not just impact California, but has rippling effects across the entire nation. California's San Joaquin Valley is a salad bowl for the world and provides a significant share of fruits and vegetables for our country. The inability of these farmers to do, to do their job would lead negatively to increased reliance on foreign food sources. Why, Mr. Chairman, would we want to do that? Also, according to an official analysis by the nonpartisan CBO, this bill will repeal and reduce nearly $300 million in federal spending over the next 10 years, while also generating nearly $250 million in revenue. To repeat, this bill cuts spending by $300 million and it increases uh, revenue by a quarter of a billion dollars. This bill is a chance to right the regulatory wrongs of the past, to end future man-made droughts, and to protect jobs and ec economic livelihood of farm workers, farmers, and their family. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I, with that, I reserve the balance the of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentlelady from California. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield my safe five minutes. Gentle ladies recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, really uh, applaud my uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Hastings, uh, with some of the statistics he was quoting about the uh, farmers in the valley. Uh, there were uh, misrepresentations which were later clarified of the actual figures that were affected, and unfortunately, they were very far apart, and that's just for the record. Uh, I'll be glad to give uh, the Mr. Speaker anybody that wants them later. But H.R. Uh, 1837, the San Joaquin Water Reliability Act, uh, is anything but. It repeals existing state law as written for the use of the water from the San Joaquin River in California's Central Valley. It reallocates water in a way that elevates agricultural uses above all other water needs. That's municipal, fisheries, uh, uh, and environmental uses. If enacted, this would, uh, bill was mostly aimed at California. Believe me, mostly California. But it would set precedent as an unprecedented standard of straight state preemption, environmental disregard, privatization of a public resource for the benefit of a select few. And it could be, in my estimation, be renamed the Barrister Employment Act. State legislature stated it best. This is the California State Legislature. 1837 is almost breathtaking in its total disregard for equity and its willful subjugation of the state of California to the whims of federal action. And may I point out that in the past my colleagues on the other side have uh, asked for less intrusion of the federal government, less uh, government control, let the locals handle it. This would do the reverse. It would put it in the hands of the federal government to be able to determine the state's rights to enact its own water laws. Despite amendments to the bill by the majority, it still seeks to make sweeping negative changes to states' ability to manage water in the West amends the state constitution and undermines California's ability to manage its own resources. It would repeal or overturn nearly 20 years of environmental protections under Central Valley Project Improvement Act, the CVPIA, and the Endangered Species Act, ESA, which is normally on the attack by my friends on the other side. It repeals San Joaquin Restoration Settlement Act, a compromise widely supported by all stakeholders, and diminishes funds for restoration. It also completely elim eliminates co-equal goals of protecting environment and allowing 
for water deliveries. It puts jobs of fishermen at risk, and uh, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council has raised concerns on the impacts of fishery and fishing communities. The Northwest fisheries were closed in 2008 and 2009 in parts of 2010. They had no fishing. The industry was lost to them. The Subcommittee of Water and Power received over 34 letters with nearly 300 stakeholders opposing this legislation. And that includes the Western States Water Council, seven states, California, Colorado, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, and Wyoming, the Department of Interior, and of course the U.S. Depart the, uh, sta uh, statement from the administration policy. Uh, we, it is also a senior senator and the junior senator of California opposed this, and the list goes on. Uh, elected officials, environmental groups, uh, the state legislature, attorney general's offices, governor's offices, and letters from, from these different states, not to mention nonpartisan, 18 governor appointed Western States Water Council. The scope of harmful provisions included in this legislation is matched only by the number of necessary provisions left out. Severity of the legislation, which benefits only a small group, not benefiting all of California. Through a series of amendments, my colleagues seek to address the glaring issues associated with the legislation, the subsidies reform, construction of new facilities, and the best of, uh, use of best available science. Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a bad bill and I urge a no vote and I uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to yield uh, five minutes to the chairman of the subcommittee that developed this legislation on the uh, Natural Resources Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I compliment the general lady from California on stating the opposite of this bill with remarkable precision. Uh, it does not repeal 20 years of California water law. It restores it by restoring the allocation that was agreed to by a broad bipartisan coalition uh, in the Bay Delta Accords in 1994. In fact, at the time, the Democratic Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt assured all parties that this agreement would be honored by the state and federal governments. His promise was broken first by his own department and most recently when a federal court deemed the Delta smelt to be more important than the livelihoods of thousands of Central Valley farm workers. Hundreds of billions of gallons of water that these communities had already paid for and depended upon were simply expropriated and blissfully and cavalierly dumped into the Pacific Ocean, turning much of California's fertile Central Valley into a dust bowl. This bill redeems the promise made to the people of California and restores the allocations that were agreed to. And we hear, well, that was then and this is now and the science has changed. Well, what they are referring to is not science. It is ideology masquerading as science. In 2010, their claims were thrown out of the federal court, which cited ideological zealots who had attempted to, in the words of the court, quote, mislead and to deceive the court into accepting what is not only not the best science, it's not science. The science is this. The Northwest Fisheries Science Center determined the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is a principal factor in the salmon migration, ocean currents. The California Department of Water Resources determined that pumps which deliver water to the Central Valley had a negligible influence on salmon and delta smelt migration. The National Academy of Sciences reported that non-native and invasive predators like the striped bass are a far more significant influence on salmon and delta smelt populations. So the second thing that this bill does is to replace the ideological zealotry that created this human disaster with practical and fact-based solutions to support native delta smelt and salmon populations. For example, as I said earlier, it's common to find striped bass in the delta gorged with salmon smolts and delta smelt. This bill allows open season on these destructive, invasive, and non-native predators. Uh, fish hatcheries produce millions of salmon smolts each year, and tens of thousands return as fully grown adults to spawn, but these, are, these fish are not allowed to be counted. This bill counts them, assuring that hatcheries will produce thriving and bountiful populations of salmon and delta smelts and any other species considered endangered. The San Joaquin River Settlement Act envisions an absurdly impractical year-round cold water salmon fishery on the hot valley floor at an estimated cost of $2 million 
per individual fish. That act was adopted uh, by the Democrats two years ago when they controlled this House. It is so expensive because it attempts to establish something that only existed sporadically in nature. Instead, this bill establishes a year-round warm water fishery that acts in concert with the habitat at a fraction of the cost. Third, the bill removes disincentives in current law that discourage farmers from purchasing surplus water in yet years, years uh, to recharge groundwater banks. It removes prohibitive regulatory restrictions on water transfers between willing buyers and willing sellers, which once had efficiently distributed water throughout that system from areas of surplus to areas of shortage. It allows environmental flows to be recycled and used by human communities once those flows have achieved their environmental purposes. Fourth, it brings the full force of federal law to invoke and protect state water rights and forbid their violation by any bureaucracy, local, state, or federal. In fact, this provision specifically addressed concerns raised by the very same opponents to the original bill, who feared that because of the unique joint operating agreement between the state and federal governments, that changes in federal allocations could lead to raids on senior water rights holders by the state government. This provision fully addresses those concerns through the federal government's legitimate constitutional authority in the 14th Amendment to protect the property rights of its citizens against encroachment by any government bureaucracy. This is the preemption issue that the opponents are raising. They are some of the same opponents who attacked the original bill for not protecting those rights. This bill doesn't preempt those rights. It specifically invokes them and protects them. It uh, brings to an end the predation on the working people of California. It places senior water rights holders in a safe and secure position and treats our water as a precious resource it is. Time of the gentleman's expired. The gentlelady from California. Yes, I yield four minutes to uh, Mr. Garamendi from uh, California. The gentleman's recognized for four minutes. <coughs> four. Uh, thank you. One hardly knows where to start when you take California water law and push it aside and preempt it with federal water law, really running over the top of the state of California, and then you steal 800,000 acre feet and transfer it to your buddies, yes, you're going to come up with a lot of reasons why it makes sense. But the reality is quite different. Let us understand very clearly here that 150 years of California water law is thrown out and a new federal law is put in place that preempts California water law. The 1994 CalFed agreement was an interim agreement. It was never, ever intended to be a permanent statutory agreement on how water would be delivered in California. In addition to that, let me understand, yes, I see your little chart over there that you're going to throw up. That was 1994, and it said precisely what we ought to do today. And that is, today, we ought to be working together to solve the problems of California water. And guess what? California is. But with this law in place, it won't happen. The ability of California to work together to solve its problems are thrown out. What sense does that make unless you want to steal 800,000 acre feet of water and take an agreement that was forged over 20 years to solve a problem on the San Joaquin River that is not for year-round salmon flows, but only for the spring salmon flows? Why would you want to do that except you want to take somebody's water? The water is the water of the fishermen as well as the water of the farmers. And by the way, facts are ugly little things. There was no 30,000 people that lost their job, no 60,000 people that lost their jobs. The University of California, Berkeley, University of California, Davis, and University of Pacific all say that the losses were less than 7,000, which almost equal to the losses Did to the fisheries. on that point? No, not yet. I'll be happy at the end of this. When we get to the end of this story, it is going to be a story for the rest of the nation. If you happen to be a western state, if you happen to be a midwestern state that has a federal water project from the Bureau of Reclamation, beware. Beware, because this is the first ever attempt to throw aside a hundred years of reclamation law in which, the, in which deference is given to the states over the power of their water rights and their water laws. 
Yes, you can say Section 4 of this bill deals with that. No, it doesn't. It does not deal with the totality of California water law. In fact, the bill destroys that totality. Western states are opposed to this. The list has been given. And other states, watch out. This is a power grab. This is a water grab. This is an imposition of the federal authority over the states, and specifically over California. And yes, Mr. Chairman, excuse me, if I might, through the chair, you said that there is 100 percent water, no, no water district except those that preceded the federal project have 100 percent allocation. Every other water district has shortage provisions in those water contracts. And by the way, whatever power we may have, we don't have the power to overcome a natural drought, which is precisely what is happening in California today and happened during the period that this bill speaks to. It was a natural doubt. Yes, there were restrictions placed on the pumps, restrictions that were necessary to protect an endangered species. And by the way, the judge that you cited, the day after, with 30, 45 days after he quit, he took a job with the water contractor that is supporting this bill. Figure it out yourself. Figure out what's going on here. This is a theft of 800,000 acre feet of environmental water. This is an overturning of California water law, and we ought not do it. Time of the I have no more time. The time of the gentleman's expired. The chair would remind members to address their remarks to the chair. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Uh, Chairman, before I yield to my, the sponsor of this legislation, I yield myself 30 seconds to simply point out recognized for 30 that seconds. The, the statistics I use as, as it relates to unemployment comes from Fresno County. That is a county that is that where all of this was impacted. The statistics that were cited by my friends across the aisle were from outside that area. Second point I want to make, I have letters here from 14 senators and four, 18 members uh, of the uh, 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 of the California legislature, and at the appropriate time, I'll insert their uh, letters in the record. And at this time, I am very pleased to yield three minutes to the sponsor of this legislation and, and a gentleman who has been an absolute leader on bringing this to the national attention, Mr. Nunez from California. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to uh, remind the gentleman from California, uh, facts are a funny thing, and the Deputy Undersecretary approved this bipartisan agreement in 1994. I would remind the gentleman also that I defended his right in the Rules Committee, Mr. Speaker, I defended the right of the Democrats to have all their amendments made in order. So, Mr. Speaker, when the federal government began to pass state preemptions to take their water away, you can see here, Mr. Speaker, that right around this time, up until this time, we had full water allotments throughout California. Yes, when there's a drought, there were a few years where we didn't have water, but look at the chaos that's er that has erupted since. This is an important point. So the Congress, by using state preemptions, has managed to take water away from cities, communities, and families. Now they claim, the opponents of this bill claim that somehow that the salmon population is, is decreasing. But we can see here in this graph at the bottom, and I know it may be hard for some folks to see, but the water exports are here. The green represents total water that, flew, that, that flowed into the delta uh, throughout uh, the last 25 years. The red line indicates salmon populations. And lo and behold, there is no correlation between the water inflow into the delta and salmon population. But I will agree that the salmon population has declined. And this bill begins to fix that problem. Why? Because the delta smelt and the salmon are being eaten by predator fish that are non-native to the delta. Let me say that again. Striped bass, non-native to the delta. This is scientific evidence. This shows as the bass population has increased the smelt population has declined. And this bill rectifies this. This bill allows fishermen to fish, to fish for the non-native species. So what this is about, we are shutting off, a, off the water to Californians and to their families because of the Delta smelt right here.
And they talk a lot about these, these dangerous pumps that are, that are pumping this water, these, these engineering projects that, that allowed this valley to bloom, that have improved the environment over the time. Less than 2% of the juvenile salmon is negligible in the pumps. But instead of looking ways to, to stop that negligible impact, we allow the predator fish, the striped bass, to eat 65 to 90 percent. Say that again. 65 to 90 percent of the juvenile salmon are being eaten by this bass. I yield, yield the gentleman uh, one additional minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. And here we have evidence of this. You can see the bass, and I know this is a little gruesome for, for some folks at home, but here you have the smelt inside the, inside the bass. But yet, this government is allowing this non-native species to eat the thing that they so love, the Delta smelt. So what's been the result, Mr. Speaker? Food lines. Food lines. In the breadbasket of the world that used to grow the nation's carrots, we now imported carrots from China to feed the people in the food lines. This is what this is about, Mr. Speaker. This is what this is about. These are children in a food line eating carrots imported from China. Does this Congress have a moral compass to do the right thing? And I ask the, the chairman for an additional one minute. Uh, recognize the gentleman for one gentleman minute. recognized for one minute. Children in food lines eating carrots imported from China. So, Mr. Speaker, we don't need any fancy speeches here today. Sixth grader from elementary school in my district, and I won't read the whole thing, but I will say this. He sent this letter. Not only does this problem affect the farming industry, it also affects the farmers, families, and their livelihood. I am sure you've heard this complaint, but before, as the future generations, it is a great concern to me. Please do what you can to get the water to the farmers once again. Then we can use the fertile soil the people of this valley have been blessed with. The sixth grader is correct. This Congress should do the right thing. We need Democrats and Republicans to come together today. As the Speaker of the House stated earlier, this is to right a wrong. And I urge passage of this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I can't believe how many of these people that wrote letters and the stakeholders, including 105 fishing agencies, be so wrong. Uh, I yield uh, three minutes to uh, Chair Mr. Chairman Markey. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. I thank the uh, gentlelady. Uh, now, while this bill directly affects the state of California, even though the state of California opposes the legislation, it is also opposed by representatives of the other western water interests, the state of Montana, the state of New Mexico, the state of Oregon, the state of Wyoming, the state of Colorado, all join California in saying they don't want this bill. And why are they all saying that? Well, they're saying it because of the precedent that it will set in upsetting settled water rights in the West. Now, to address that issue, the Republicans have inserted in the bill language that says this bill does not set a precedent in upsetting all the water rights in the West as it upsets all the water rights in California. So what's that like? Well, in 1929, the Belgian surrealist painter, René Magritte, painted a painting of a tobacco pipe. And under the pipe, he painted the words, this is not a pipe. But of course, it was a pipe, or at least a painting of a, uh, of a pipe. And this bill has a similar surrealistic quality to it. The bill states that the violence of this bill in upsetting water rights is not a precedent. That 
nothing that happens in California will be a precedent for any other state. Which is why, of course, all the other states are opposing the bill because of the precedent that it sets. This bill sets the precedent to upset all those other arrangements. Others in the West who may wish to restructure water rights elsewhere around the West will look to it as a precedent. So I would say to the majority, nice job, but no cigar. Clearly, this bill does set a bad precedent. And we can't get around that fact just by putting in the bill that it does not set a precedent. You are, for all intents and purposes, taking all of those arrangements set up over generations and in one bill, opposed by all those states, upsetting the apple cart and setting a brand new era. And you cannot get around it by saying in the bill, this does not set a precedent. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the gentleman from Washington. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am very pleased to yield two and a half minutes to the gentleman from Northern California, an individual who unfortunately is leaving Congress after this, but whom has been a leader on property rights uh, in that part of uh, his, his state of California. Mr. Herger, two and a half minutes. The gentleman from California is recognized for two and a half minutes. Mr. Speaker, I originally voiced, voiced strong concerns when this legislation was first introduced last year, arguing that it would negatively impact Northern California's water supplies and undermine our senior water rights. But under Chairman Hastings' leadership, it has come a very, very long way. We have amended the bill so it not only protects Northern California water and power users I represent, but in many respects puts them in a materially better position. As such, I intend to strongly support it. It contains important reforms to the CFIA, a law that has, like so many others, gone awry, including greater certainty for agriculture through longer-term contracts, improved financial accountability, and a cap on the amount of ratepayers will pay. I represent must pay into the restoration fund. Most importantly, a new Title IV contains an explicit federal recognition of California water rights priority system and area of origin protections. Going forward, it will also ensure water users in our area are not harmed by efforts to address environmental and water quality challenges in California. We have created an important baseline for any water legislation to ensure Northern California's water needs will be met first. There is broad support for these provisions, including from the Tehama Calusa Canal Authority, representing 17 water districts, the Northern California Water Association, eight absolute priority settlement contractors, the City of Reading, Reading Electric Utility, and the Family Water Alliance, a group representing Sacramento Valley landowners. In short, the bill seeks to solve another tragic ESA cause water shortage facing our family farmers in California, and it does so while fully protecting senior water right holders in my district and in many ways enhancing their positions. I urge a strong support and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield uh, uh, three and a half minutes to Mr. Costa from California. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. I thank three the gentleman. I, I thank the gentlewoman. Mr. Speaker, I rise to discuss a matter of great importance to my constituents in the San Joaquin Valley and that's the future of our water supply. More importantly, it's our nation's food supply and therefore an important part of the world's food supply. H.R. 1837 is not perfect. It has issues I think the authors should seriously consider. But I am supporting the legislation today because of a number of important provisions it contains. Title I and three of the legislation aim to address the biggest challenges for water supply in California. In 2009 and 2010, Valley communities suffered through a hydrological and regulatory drought that was insufferable. This year, we are again faced with below average snowpack in the mountains and may see as little as a 30% allocation 
for water in our area. My congressional district is the most impacted in California by this shortfall. Farmers, farm workers, and farm communities that live in my district is what I'm talking about. Our water system is broken in California, but while we're trying to fix it, we need operational flexibility while we continue to work on the long-term issues of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. We should be discussing more constructive ways in which we can work together. Title II of this measure repeals and replaces the San Joaquin River Restoration Act. Well, after 18 years of litigation, the parties involved decided to reach an out-of-court settlement agreement. We can all dispute that, but it was those 22 districts, local government, that we respected who asked them to codify their out-of-court settlement agreement. I note that the Frank Water District Authority, excuse me, continues to oppose Title II of the bill, as do many of the districts who were involved with the writing and the negotiation of the settlement agreement. Now, we do have problems with the implementation of the program, Congressman Cardozo and I will tell you, from the schedule to cost to third-party impacts for the fulfillment of the water management goal, which is critical to the water users. These as issues need to be addressed. But simply repealing, repealing the settlement agreement won't solve any of these problems, in my view. In fact, I'm certain they'll be back in court the next day, and that's not solving a problem. We have had a long history of working on a bipartisan basis in California and in the San Joaquin Valley among our representatives on water. It frustrates me to see the division on the House floor that has politicized this situation and argu arguably does nothing for the people that I represent. I have always been willing to work on both sides of the aisle with the Senate, with the administration to get things done for our valley and I've done it throughout my career. But unless we are willing to work with Senator Feinstein, who I know wants to be helpful, I predict this measure today, as it is proposed, will never be heard in the United States Senate. Therefore, we will never bring an additional single drop of water to our region that is desperately needed. Drop of water to our region that is desperately needed of more water. I can think that we can do better for our constituents by working together on a bipartisan basis with both houses to develop and implement solutions both in the long term and the short term. These are the efforts that really will increase our water supply, which all Californians need to, and deserve to have. I yield the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how much time on both sides? The gentleman from Washington has uh, five and a, 12 and a half minutes remaining, and the gentlelady from California has 15 and a half minutes remaining. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I am very pleased to yield three minutes to a new member from California who represents part of this area that was, has been devastated and who is an integral player on developing this legislation, Mr. Denham from California. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, a lot has been said about our area of the state where you have 30 to 40 percent unemployment in some areas. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It is an American jobs issue to put people back to work. And some people say, well, those aren't the kind of jobs that we want. You know, it's a dusty, uh, dirty uh, uh, way to earn a living. Yeah, it is dusty. It is dirty. I'm a farmer. And uh, without water, you shut down not only my farm, but you shut down farms throughout the valley. You shut off our food supply. You shut off uh, all of those jobs that desperately rely on water. Now, a lot of people like to talk about a deal is a deal. Back in 94, we had this grand deal. And, uh, that took CVPIA water, uh, it took 800,000 acre feet for environmental purposes. The deal was that water was supposed to be replaced. The Department of the Interior never just stole 800,000 acre feet of water, which still has to be paid for by the contracts. But nevertheless, we need to make sure that our va valley farmers are, are held whole. But let me talk about a couple of the different uh, issues with, uh, within this bill. Um, you know, again, this is about our, our priorities as a House. The Senate may or may not agree with them. But we'll never know if we don't have the debate. Shouldn't the Senate at least have an opportunity to look at this bill and vo vote on the bill and debate the bill? If they don't like the bill, present us your own. But don't just ignore the Valley Farmers. Don't just ignore the amount of jobs that we're losing as a state. You don't like it, come up with your own bill. We'll vote on that. We'll debate on that. Well, we're going to express our priority. And our priority is about the jobs of the Central Valley. We're going to send you a bill that not only deals with greater water certainty, 
but also deals with duplicative regulation. You know, I'm also on the Transportation Committee, and whether it's the Resources Committee or the Transportation Committee, when you have a higher environmental law, like California does, why go through the same environmental policy twice? Why not streamline NEPA so that you don't have that duplicative regulation that shuts down our water projects? And while we're at it, we can fight all we want on where the water that we currently have is delivered or who wins and who loses. But we lose as a state, we lose as a country until we get more water storage. We put an amendment in this bill in committee that uh, will authorize new water storage, whether it's Sites Reservoir, Los Vaqueros, Shasta, or in my area, Temperance Flat. But we have to have more off-stream storage. And in Los Vaqueros, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Congressman Garamendi's own district, in his own backyard, we can have water storage today without any cost to the federal taxpayers. Well, we've got users that are willing to pay for more water storage and the water is desperately needed. Why wouldn't we approve those projects? That's authorized in this bill. This bill deals with certainty. This does deal with a number of years of a problem and it certainly deals with drought years as well as certainty in wet years. But it also deals with greater water storage. So if you want to end this debate once and for all, Let's make sure we keep up with the population growth of California. Let's have greater water storage, and let's solve this problem so that we don't have the double-digit unemployment in the Central Valley. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I must mention uh, that California agriculture had the biggest banner year during the, that period. In other words, they made in the billions more than they had in prior years uh, during this drought. So with that, I'd like to yield uh, three minutes to Mr. McNerney from California. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, someone needs to stand up and defend the Delta. I'm standing to express my strong opposition to H.R. 1837. This legislation will do tremendous damage and harm to the San Joaquin Delta, an area that I'm honored to represent. The San Joaquin Delta is a treasure for California and the entire nation. The Delta flows through five counties and sustains major cities, small towns, and lush farmland. Agriculture is the economic backbone of the Delta, generating nearly $800 million per year in uh, revenue in, 19, in 2009. Unfortunately, the Delta ecosystem is now in decline due to excessive water shipments to the south. Poor water quality is a threat to the region's entire agricultural economy and heritage. H.R. 1837 would even ship more water out of the Delta turning this precious estuary into a salty, stagnant marsh, crushing, crushing the local economy and costing the Delta region thousands and thousands of jobs. This bill is a blatant water grab meant to help some communities at the expense of others. Contrary to the conservative principles that, 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 that this bill's proponents claim to cherish, H.R. 1837 uses the power of the federal government to undermine states' rights. Dozens of local governments, businesses, agricultural advocates, environmental groups, and others oppose H.R. 1837. I have letters from these groups, and I request unanimous, unanimous consent to enter them into the record. This request will be considered under general leave. May continue. H.R. 1837 would devastate my entire region. But folks from other states should also oppose this bill with little debate and complete disregard for the consequences. This bill sets a dangerous precedent for that the federal government can undermine state water law developed over decades. Your state could be next. This bill is a shameful attempt to rewrite California water laws to, ben to benefit a few selected water users, regardless of how much harm is done to other parts of the states. Democrats and Republicans should stand united in our desire to block this legislation from becoming law. I urge my colleagues in the strongest possible terms to oppose H.R. 1837. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield one minute to the gentleman from New Mexico, another member from the West and the past, uh, or chairman of the Western, Water, Western uh, Caucus that knows this issue very well. Mr. Pierce, one minute. The gentleman from New Mexico is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of H.R. 1837. The nation is faced with trillion dollar deficits, persistent unemployment above 8%. 
and we continue to use the federal government to kill jobs and to export them to China. You can take a look at what the President recently did regarding the Keystone Pipeline. You can look at the export of, of the rare earth mineral mines to China. But this is the one that is most offensive, this, this exporting of our agriculture products. San Joaquin Valley used to place vegetables, safe vegetables grown in America on store shelves across the country. Today we import uh, vegetables from countries that use pesticides that are disallowed here. We have an unsafe food supply, we have more people out of work, and we have deficits because we don't have tax-paying citizens. This bill simply is a common-sense bipartisan solution that puts people back to work, provides a safe food supply, and makes a